Welcome back. In this second learning objective, we are going to be talking about how, and actually doing it, recording purchases under a perpetual inventory system. However, first, in order to learn what a perpetual inventory system is, let's talk about a periodic inventory system. So a periodic inventory system details records of merchandise uh, not kept throughout the period. So really, we don't really know what's going on <laughs> um, throughout the period. And cost of goods sold is only determined at the end of the accounting period, uh, once inventory is counted. So then our cost of goods available for sale, similar to our previous you know, um, learning objective, is still where beginning inventory plus cost of goods purchased or purchases uh, is equal to our cost available for sale. And our cost of goods sold is equal to our cost available for sale, so everything that's there, minus ending inventory. So that's how we determine our cost of goods sold. Under this method, because you're just doing it once at the end, it is often simpler, though it is less precise. So let's take a look at this in a picture format. So we have our beginning inventory plus all of our purchases equals our goods available for sale. And then uh, we count our inventory and the difference is our cost of goods sold. So in this method, we do not need to have um, a separate journal entry for shrinkage uh, because we're counting the inventory at the end. This cost of goods sold would equal all of the transactions and then inherently an amount for shrinkage. So under this periodic inventory system, we don't really know how, like what's the amount for theft, what's the amount for breakage, what's the amount for um, you know, uh, supplier shortage or you know, whatnot. We just know, hey, we started with this much, we bought this much, we were left with this much. And the difference is our cost of goods sold. All right, so less precise, less um, information available to kind of like, you know, you know up your <laughs> security next time going forward. However, it's just easier. It's really, really that it's easier because <laughs> now we're gonna see the perpetual inventory system. Detailed records are kept for the cost of each product purchased and, and sold. The cost of goods sold is the reduction in inventory. Um, and the management knows the cost of goods sold in inventory balances at all times. A physical count is done at least once a year to adjust perpetual records to actual, again, to account for items like shrinkage. And this system, while it enables effective control of the inventory, it is also onerous. It just, it takes time. It takes time. So I don't know, what does a company need to do? Um, it really just depends on the size. Uh, you know, if you're Loblaws, you'll want to know what's going in, what's going out, because we're literally talking about billions of dollars of sales every year. I have to look at the number whenever I talk about um, Loblaws, because I honestly, I believe it's 100 billion, if not more, of sales. That is a lot of strawberries, people. Um, and their profit margins, so not just their gross profit, but their overall profit margins, so after all, COGS, cost of goods sold, and after all operating expenses, it's like two to 3%. So they need to have good controls on their system in order to know, you know what's kind of going, going on, um, you know, how many strawberries are walking at the door. So in picture format, pretty much the same system. It looks very similar um, to what we saw under our periodic inventory system. However, what is different is when the cost of goods sold are determined. And that is after every flip and sale. Every flip and sale. Could you imagine if you're like a mom and pop shop and you know, I guess with like software and stuff, um, if you can have a, a decent POS point of sale uh, system, then it's more manageable. But like back in the day when everybody did like things off of pen and paper, this would be super onerous. So, um, determined after every sale, and then we at all times know what do we have as our inventory on the shelf, um, and what do we have as far as items that we've sold throughout the period. The purchases for merchandising 
it's the same. It's same, same. So whether or not you're purchasing for periodic or a um, perpetual inventory system, we record um, purchases and um, it would be debit inventory and credit cash or uh, AP. Just depends if you bought it with cash or on account. If it's on account, it would be on accounts payable. So in order to count inventory, this includes all items that get the merchandise to a place of business and ready for sale. This includes freight and applicable taxes, so shipping, any taxes um, that are non-refundable. So for example, if you have duty taxes from the states, that would be part of your inventory. Um, if you had, so stocking, if you had special cooling, so I know we talk about this when we analyze um, like Metro and Sobe's financial statements, you know, it's also the cost of inventory has to do with, um, you know, did you have to um, refrigerate the items in the truck and, you know, are, were you responsible for that separately from the freight? Um, are you, you know, do you have freezers in your warehouse? All of these items need to be captured as part of the cost of the inventory. Then um, you might get some purchase discounts. Uh, you may return some items. You might get um, allowances or again, like I said, discounts. And that would actually reduce the amount that you pay. Therefore, it would reduce the amount of cost to the inventory. So we record all of these as net. So we include expenses like freight and taxes that are non-refundable, and we subtract any purchase returns, allowances, or discount. All right. So a bit more on tax, sales tax and freight. So GST and HST do not form a part of these inventory taxes, and that is because they are refundable fundable. So these indirect taxes, um, when say Sobeys were to buy, um, Sobeys is it's difficult because you really only in Canada, GST and HST, there's very specific rules. So let us, um, and then it's only if it's like processing done on the item. So for example, um, if something uh, like sushi, like the grocery store sushi, when you buy that, it has HST as a sale. Well, if they make it in-house, then um, they wouldn't have had to pay any HST uh, on the items, on their rice or whatever they're making. Um, but say they purchase it from like a third party, they purchased something that is processed, so that likely has HST. That doesn't count as part of our inventory cost. It goes to a separate account. And then whenever uh, Sobeys, sells an item that is HST or GST applicable, uh, they would also then put that amount that they earned in a separate account, and then they would have to remit, so pay or receive a um, check for the difference of whatever they, uh, let's see, say they collected $100 and then they paid 50, um, they would have to then only remit $50 of that. Uh, yeah, so we do not include GST or HST as part of the um, cost of goods sold. It goes to a separate account and is remitted separately. Uh, more on that, we'll touch on it a bit in a subsequent chapter, but you'll see more of that in your tax class, as well as again in Intermediate Financial too. Okay, so FOB shipping refers to, um, or free onboard, and this is whether or not the title or ownership of goods transfers when it's destination, that means um, that the title or ownership transfers um, when it comes to the buyer's place of business. And when this happens, then the sellers pay for shipping. And when it's um, FOB shipping point, that means it becomes the buyers at the point of shipping. And so then the buyers pay for the shipping. So. Um, if it's not your good until it gets to destination, you don't pay for the shipping because it's not your good. But if it's your point, your good at the point where it's shipped, um, then it's your goods and you must get it to wherever you want it. So if there is freight paid by the buyer, that is FOB at the point of shipping, then that becomes a part of the inventory cost pricing. So 
part of that merchandise purchased or purchases. So my question to you is who pays the freight? The seller or the buyer? I didn't mean to have this slide a little bit um, after because I wanted you to have to recall this, but we'll just go for it now. In your own words, who pays the freight, the buyer or the seller, when the shipping terms are FOB shipping or FOB destination? Let's see if you recall. All right, if you said FOB shipping means the buyer is responsible, you are absolutely correct. And why is that? Well, because at the point in which it is shipped, that means it's the buyer's item, the title has transferred, and the buyer is responsible for that item to come to the buyer. And if it's FOB shipping, it's not my inventory until it's received to me. Um, therefore, it's received to me, I'm not responsible for those shipping costs, and therefore it's not inventoried as one of those costs of, costs of purchases. All right, next item. Purchases, returns, and allowances. A purchaser returns the goods to the seller and receives a cash refund or credit. The buyer may choose to then keep the merchandise if the seller is willing to give them allowance from the purchase price. In both of those cases, the result is a decrease to the cost of goods purchased. So the decrease in the purchases. So, Good to know um, that that would be a decrease to the amount of our purchases and therefore a decrease to our price in inventory and therefore would you know eventually flow through and be a reduced amount to our cost of goods sold. All right, what about purchase discounts? Well, a purchase discount is offered to encourage early payment. So this is interesting. Example, 210 net 30, huh? 210 means you get a 2% discount if you pay within 10 days. However, the entire invoice is due in 30 days. So they're literally gonna give you a discount if you pay 20 days earlier than you need to. All right, so when this happens, um, it's recorded separately from when the payment is made and it is a decrease to the inventory account. So let's take a look at this. Martin Corporation pays $5,000, pardon me, purchases $5,000 of merchandise on March 1st with credit terms of 310 and 30. If Martin pays on March 10th, what is the cost of the purchase? Give you a moment and then we'll do the journal entries. All right, so on March 1st, let's see, debit, inventory, of 5,000 and credit accounts payable for 5,000. Cool. And then on March 10th, oh, just, just in time, uh, they pay for the invoice. And so they are going to pay. They're going to pay. So we're going to get rid of that accounts payable. Oops, sorry. Mm, debit. Accounts payable, they're gonna get rid of that for 5,000 because they no longer owe the 5,000, but they are going to have cash out the door of 97%, so 100 minus that three, times by 5,000. And so that is a credit, pardon me, of cash out the door of 48.50. And then to balance um, our amount here, that would be the 3% of the $5,000, that goes to our inventory account. And it would be likely an inventory account, like a sub account um, that would roll up to inventory of like um, sales discount or inventory sales discount. But that would be to reflect the fact that they paid it within the um, 10 days. And so they get that discount there. They get that awesome discount of 150. So then to answer the question, what is the cost of this purchase? Well, the cost of the purchase was the original amount less the discount, the inventory sales discount, um, or I guess the purchase discount. So the actual cost of the inventory would be 48.50. And you can be like, hey, good job um, on capturing all of those um, discounts. So awesome work. All right, let's go back to the slides. 
All right, to wrap it up, let's look at a summary of purchase transactions. When you buy it, inventory goes up and your cash or accounts payable goes down. If you own, um, if it's FOB shipping, it means you bought it at the point that it shipped, therefore you have to pay those shipping costs. Your inventory is gonna increase and your cash or accounts payable is gonna go down. Or I guess AP would go up because you owe more. All right, um, inventory goes up. If you get any purchases, um, pardon me, purchase returns, allowances, then um, it reduces the amount of inventory and also reduces the amount that you owe. Similarly, when you pay creditors on account within the discount period, you earn that discount. So you're like, cool, um, that 3% of inventory goes down and decreases your inventory and you don't have to um, pay as much cash at the door and your entire debt is reversed. However, if you pay your creditors after the discount period, you simply reverse the accounts payable because you booked the full amount when you made the commitment to sell. So kind of think about it like this. You're like, yeah, 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 I promise, I promise I'll pay you back, I'll pay you or I'll pay you for this. Um, but you need to record the liability at the full amount because you hadn't yet paid them back. The moment you pay them back, then you determine, was it early? Cool, recognize that discount. Or was it later than you thought, but still within the N30 terms? Well, no discount, but you still get to remove that accounts payable. All right, thank you so much. I will see you in the next video.